there was great excitement in the air on the continent of Rulandia. This was the name the colony members had finally decided to call the landmass they now called home. Given that the other continents on the planet of Judison were soon to be explored, it seemed only right to name the first established region before the Infinite Lotus spacecraft took off on their first exploration journey across the vast blue oceans of the planet. With the information that had been gathered by space probes from Earth some 15 years previously, the colony had little information to go by with regards to the continents they were about to visit. Although Rulandia had been probed extensively before the first ship, Reborn, had arrived over 11 years ago, there had only been limited data obtained from the other continents of Judison. In several cases, the probes had only transmitted data for a few minutes after touching down upon the planet's surface. For whatever reason, the processing units had been switched off. These occurrences seemed most unusual because it appeared the probes had landed on the planet without incident, and the only explanation the scientists could give for this anomaly was that something or someone on the planet had tampered with the units. With this thought in the back of Dr. Greenwich's mind, he stood at the entrance to the ship waiting to address the colony members who had come to watch the spacecraft depart. Neon's normally calm demeanor seemed a little strained that morning as he watched Zacharias's wife and two youngest children join the colony members making ready to leave. He had advised the tycoon that they had no idea of what dangerous situations may lay ahead for the explorers, and it would have been a safer idea for all Zacharias's children to stay behind with their grandmother, at least until the safety of the new continents had been established. However, the headstrong businessman would not be swayed from his decision to take his children with him, and given the spacecraft was owned by the tycoon, Neon had no option left but to let the family members accompany them on their mission. As the colony's advisor, everyone looked up to Neon, so there was no hesitation from the colony's men, including Bracken, Amos, and Noah, to tag along on their first mission. Even Indigo asked if she could join them. However, Crimson, Indigo's sister, would have to stay behind this time around. She was the only other medically trained personnel at the colony, so she needed to stay on Rulandia. Eventually, Neon was planning to start a training program to amend this issue. He had already obtained a structured academic training course from his data watch, which as time allowed, he planned to implement with the handful of willing trainees who were interested in a medical career. However, firstly, he wanted to complete their mission to map out the planet, because up until the arrival of the Infinite Lotus, the colony had no way of accomplishing this goal. Given there were so many new places to explore, he felt that the first eleven years on the planet had been quite long enough to wait for this mission to go ahead. The group fell silent as Neon cleared his throat to speak. Welcome everyone who has come to wish us well on this mission. Given that we have limited knowledge of what we are to face ahead of us, I have placed Teal in charge of the colony while I'm away. Not only is she known and respected by all of you, as my partner, she has the most knowledge as to how I like the systems of Rulandia to run. Teal will also be in direct communication with me on a daily basis, so should a matter arise that is out of her control, I will be available to lend my assistance. However, with that said, I do not see there being any reason for this to be the case, because I'm sure she will have your utmost support. For those of you who are unsure what we plan to obtain by exploring other continents over this vast planet we now call home, I'm hoping we will learn more about our new environment. Given the lessons we have learned by mistakes made on Earth, I never want to see them repeated on Judaism. Understanding our environment to its full potential and also the evolution of Judaism will help us in the quest to achieve this goal. For this first mission, we hope to cover several continents and plan to be gone for several weeks. So until we return, 
Be well, everyone, and hopefully we will have some interesting tales to tell you upon our return. Everyone cheered and clapped as the team chosen for the mission boarded the spacecraft. Teal and her children rushed forward to give Neon, Bracken, and Indigo a hug before the crew made ready to close the main door of the ship and prepare for takeoff. Zacharias's daughter, Amethyst, looked a little nervous as she stood next to her mother, Azure, and brother Cain while the door was firmly closed behind them. Are we going to have to lie in those horrid hibernation capsules again, Mummy? No, dear. They are only used for long-distance travel. Your mother is quite right, Amethyst. However, I want you and your brother to stay seated with your magno belt switched on. The ship's captain will advise you when you may leave the safety of your seats. But until he does, you are to remain seated. Do you hear me? Your father is quite right, children. Although we are not going to be traveling very fast, we do not know what lies ahead of us. Therefore, you both, cooperating is paramount. It did not take long for the jet engines to roar into life, and soon they were gliding at a slow speed, as low as the captain would allow the ship to, near the vast, deep blue ocean below them. Amos and Bracken were in charge of mapping out their progress, and it didn't take the explorers long to see land ahead. There were several very small islands surrounding one large enough to land the ship. Its sandy beach was as white as fine porcelain, and as they made ready to land the ship, the palm trees swayed back and forth with the downdraft created by the jet engines. Zacharias's family were advised to stay on board while a landing party comprising of Neon, Bracken, Amos, and Ash alighted on the beach. Ash was the colony's only botanist, and he immediately started to scan the nearest palm trees, while the others took in their surroundings. It says on my data watch that this species of palm has an edible fruit called a coconut. As he said this, Ash looked up the length of the long, ringed tree trunk and saw clusters of huge, oddly shaped yellow berries. Bracken, do you think you can use your laser gun and shoot down a bunch of that fruit without damaging it? Bracken took out his laser gun, and with pinpoint accuracy, he shot down the whole bunch of coconuts, which landed on the sand with a resounding thud. Ash took one from the bunch and rolled it around in his hands. I'm going to try hitting this against the trunk of a palm tree and see if I can open it. With a couple of good whacks to the side of the tree, the flesh of the coconut split open and the water contained inside went everywhere including all down the front of Ash's flight suit. The group couldn't help but laugh at the sight of Ash standing there in total disbelief that so much liquid could have expelled from inside the coconut hull. Well, that was a waste, because I've just finished reading that you can drink the liquid from inside these shells. May I suggest you try this? Just be sure you point it at the fruit. Reattaching a hand is not in my plans to this mission. Neon handed the younger man a metallic laser knife. Ash looked at Neon with a disparaging expression on his face. He knew the group advisor was razzing him, but he already felt foolish enough without the added ribbing. With the fast action of the laser knife, they were all soon trying the milky freshness of the coconut juice, and Ash gathered up some of the coconuts to take back to the ship for the other mission members to enjoy. No sooner had he left than Amos asked if he might take a sky bike and check out a couple of the smaller islands, while Neon and Bracken carried on exploring the island they had landed on. That is okay. Make sure you have your laser weapon at the ready. Uh, they look much the same as this island, sir. I can't see there being any problem. That may be the case, Amos, but I take nothing for granted. It didn't take long for Amos to get the sky bike from the ship, and he quickly made his way to the nearest island, which was a short distance from the others. He then yelled across the water to them. Do you want me to bring the coconuts from the palms here? Before Neon had time to answer him, they could hear him swearing loudly, and then a high-pitched sound of an insect squealing. You okay, Amos? Yeah. One of those sangry millipedes bit me. 
I've flipped it away on its back. They sure are no- Amos never finished his sentence. Instead, all they could hear was the distressed man screaming in terror. By the time Neon and Bracken had raced to get on the other skybike and reached the island, the scene which lay before them was not a pleasant one. Amos' skybike stood off the ground in hover mode, and next to it his laser weapon lay on the sand along with the metal objects he had been carrying on his person and his shredded flight suit. But as for their companion, all that was left was his skeletal remains. Every last piece of flesh hair, and organs had been totally stripped from his bones by thousands of giant sangre millipedes who scuttled around the remaining skeleton, a mass infestation of man-eating bugs. We may as well leave the, his remains here. It seems pointless to take him with us now. Neon pulled his laser gun out and flicked the switch to echo mode. With the pull of the trigger, the laser beam bounced along the ground like ripples of water on a pond and obliterated all the bugs that lay in its path. Bracken quickly jumped onto the other's skybike, and they flew back to the ship in silence. He was shocked and deeply saddened by what had just happened to his best friend. They had been buddies for a very long time, and for their friendship to end in such a gruesome way was an unbearable thought to deal with. Back at the spacecraft, everyone sat in silence while Neon relayed to them what had become of Amos. These insects were a good deal larger in size than the millipede we have at home. I'm assuming they are a subspecies of the Sangri millipede. I only hope that they are isolated to that island and have not spread throughout the continents we are about to visit. The time it took for them to devour Amos was incredibly fast and... I should not like to see any more of us come to such a carnivorous end. I've never seen the sangry millipedes act like that on Rilandia. Sucking blood for sure, but not actually eat someone's flesh. Are we done with this place? Zacharias asked their leader this question after he had looked over at the frightened faces of his children. Neon nodded in acknowledgement although he first wanted to be sure that they had covered all aspects of the work that needed to be processed before they departed the islands. Ash, have you got all the samples you need to take? As much as I'd care to collect more, after hearing what you've just told us, sir, the ones I've taken already will do just fine. Well, let's depart for the next landmass, however. Now we know one of the hazards to be aware of. We will make sure to, that we stick to the sky bikes when we land at our next destination. At least until we know this form of danger can be ruled out. No one spoke as the ship's engine roared back into life. Neon especially was feeling very uneasy that they had lost one of their members so early into their journey. He was going to ensure the group remained extremely vigilant for the remainder of their mission. With the infinite lotus moving forward at slow speed, Apart from a few small islands much like the ones they had already seen, it took some time for the crew to sight the next sizable landmass, and this area was very large indeed. Ash, who had taken on Amos's job, was having trouble trying to map out the exact size of the continent, so Neon asked the captain to take the ship upwards into space, so it was easier to gauge the total surface area. Once Ash had made the final calculations, they discovered that this continent was approximately seven times larger in size than Rulandia. Captain, given how large this region is, I think we should fly at a lower altitude and survey it closely before we find somewhere to land. This continent seemed vastly different than Rulandia. Most of the region was covered with thick, evergreen forests, and where there were open plains, Volcanoes seemed to dominate the surrounding area, like large, sleeping giants. A vote was cast to touch down on one of these large plains, but close enough to a forest so that Ash could take more plant samples. This time, Neon said that he would take Bracken with him to first survey the area, then, once they had deemed it safe enough, they would let everyone off the ship to stretch their legs.
The pair took with them small portions of Diplodocus meat to throw on the ground in hope of attracting any Sangre millipedes that may be lurking about the area. Thankfully, none were detected. However, the meat was soon devoured by small, lizard-like creatures. They seemed harmless enough, because as soon as Bracken flew close to them, they scurried off back down into their burrows to get away from the strange human on his odd flying machine. After the men had surveyed the area and deemed it safe, they returned to the ship to advise the others that they could walk outside. At first, Zacharias's family seemed a little hesitant to stroll away from the main doors of the spacecraft, but when Indigo picked up several brightly colored rocks to show the children, they soon started following her to see if they could find more. I'm going to gather more than you. Cain enthusiastically ran ahead of Indigo and Amethyst to try and pick the rocks up before the girls could reach them. Suddenly, without warning, a dark shadow swooped down from the sky and a huge bird-like creature took up the back of Cain's flight suit in its large beak and flapped away with the lad, crying out frantically for help. Indigo chased after them, but it was to no avail. When Bracken saw what was happening, he raced to the sky bike. In a matter of minutes, he was close behind the creature, which had been slowed down considerably by the heavy weight it was carrying. Bracken flicked his laser gun to slow stun mode. He was concerned that if he killed the beast outright, it would let go of Cain, and he would plummet to the ground before Bracken had time to position the bike under the creature and retrieve the lad. Using this technique did indeed have its merits, and Cain was soon holding on tightly to Bracken's waist on the pillion position of the bike. The creature, which had become disorientated by the laser, was an easy target for Bracken as he flicked the mode on his gun and watched the dead bird turn over in circles as it fell to the ground. The group below hurried over to the creature and Noah moved its head around so they could get a better look at it. It had an odd-looking long horn upon its head that was almost the length of its beak. Its wings were about six meters in length, with skin flaps instead of feathers. They were almost rubbery in texture, and Noah pulled a wing out to its full length to get a better look at them. While he was doing this, Neon began to check over Cain, who stood there trembling uncontrollably after his frightening ordeal. I was almost killed. You do not appear to be hurt, young man. It is a lucky thing that that creature only took a hold of your flight suit. But after that fright, I'll give you something that will calm you down a little. After he said this, Neon patted the boy's head in a reassuring gesture. He then took a metallic needle kit from his bag, which Ash had just brought over from the ship. He placed the instrument on Kane's forehead and pushed the stopper. The lad stopped shaking immediately, and his father carried him back to the ship to have a rest after his harrowing experience. At the same time, the rest of the group were still standing next to the strange, bird-like creature, while Ash flipped up the screen of his data watch and read out the information it had returned about their unwelcome visitor. This animal is called a pteranodon, and they roamed Earth in the late Cretaceous period, 85 million years ago. I guess it seems our Diplodocus are not the only prehistoric creatures on Judison. That being the case, we need to also be aware of this hazard as well. I said years ago, when we first discovered the Diplodocus on Rulandia, there were some nasty carnivore breeds of dinosaurs that used to roam Earth. We need to be mindful of that. This continent is a great deal larger than our own, and given there are pterodons here, their existence could be a probability. Also, may I add, you did well, Bracken. Your quick thinking saved young Cain from certain death. And after that unwanted excitement, I think we should return to the ship for some lunch. Before I go, I just want to take a sample from this creature for Noah and I to study. Ash took Neon's laser knife from his pocket, which he had yet to give back to their advisor. He pointed it at the thigh muscle of the bird-like creature and carved off a portion of meat from the bone. Once this was done and the group had returned to the ship, 
there suddenly came loud screeching behind them, and when they spun around to look, several more Tyranodon appeared out of the sky flying towards their companion. They landed on the ground next to the dead creature, and started to rip strips of meat from its carcass with their strong beaks. Azure stood at the door to the spacecraft, with a disapproving look on her face. I'm starting to regret that Zacharias insisted we come with him on this mission. It is far too dangerous for our children. After that creature had poor Cain in its grasp, he does not wish to leave the ship at all. Nor will I let Amethyst out of my sight. I can assure you of that, Dr. Greenwich. When are we to return to Elandia? I completely understand your reasoning for not wanting your children to leave the ship, Ezra. However... We have a mission to complete, and we need to have all of Judison's continents mapped out before we return home. As for the exploration of this region, after lunch, I'd like you, Noah, to take one of the sky bikes, and I will ride Pillin as your shotgun. Ash, you can take the other bike, and Bracken shall ride with you as your protection, while we check out the forests of the north of our location. I want us to be totally prepared for any... More nasty surprises. Right, I'm famished. Let's eat. An hour later, Noah and Ash equipped themselves with sample bottles and data watches, while Neon and Bracken checked their laser weapons were set to kill anything that should try to attack the group. Indigo stood nervously next to the skybike as her boyfriend made ready to leave. Thoughts of their friend Amos's death were firmly cemented in the back of her mind. Bracken leaned over from the bike and gave her a kiss. See you in a bit. Be careful out there, you hear? She never got to hear his reply as the bikes took off with a swooshing sound into the sky heading towards the lush, green forest in the distance. It didn't take the men long to reach it and all of them seemed very surprised just how thick the canopy of the trees were. When they came to a clearing, Noah was the first to notice a group of very large dinosaurs poking their heads up to eat the foliage of the treetops. They placed their bikes into hover mode while Noah checked out the species of dinosaur on his data watch. These large beasts are called brachiosaurus. The trees they eat are normally conifers, cyads, and ginkgos. Would that be what these trees are, Ash? The young botanist opened his data watch to verify the information Noah had just given him. This is exactly what they are. You'll be doing my job for me soon, Noah. Well, shall we carry on? Neon seemed a little impatient. He could see dark clouds brewing ahead of them and he wanted to get back to the ship before the storm arrived at their location. Just after he said this, there was a loud, thundery sound coming from below them, and the Brachiosaurus stopped eating and looked up in panic. The ground started to violently shake about them. What the? Both Bracken and Neon drew their laser guns at the same time. Ash, on the other hand, remained calm because he realized what was occurring. It is okay. I know what is happening. It is an earthquake. Judison must be built on tectonic plates, like Earth. One of the plates is moving under the other one. That is what causes the shaking. Well, I just hope the ship is alright, or it is stationed. I think we should return to make sure everyone is okay. However, before they had a chance to turn their bikes around, a lightning bolt ripped through the darkening sky and struck the back of Noah and Neon's bike, sending the machine spinning out of control towards the forest canopy below them. There was nothing Ash and Bracken could do other than race towards the pair as their bike disappeared from sight amongst the vast green foliage with the sound of crashing branches as they fell. The loud noise startled the Brachiosaurus, who had only just started to relax after the earthquake. The ground shook once more, but this time it was the scared beasts thundering through the woodlands to escape the noise. Thankfully, the herd headed in the opposite direction, away from the location in which the men had disappeared. Ash placed their bike in hover mode just above the ground, while Bracken jumped down to assess Noah's injuries. He lay very still next to the damaged machine, 
but there was no sign of Neon at all. Take the bike and scout around until you find Dr. Greenwich. I'll be all right here with Noah in the meantime. Noah was breathing, but had been knocked out when he fell from the bike. Bracken was more worried about what had happened to their leader, because with the dense undergrowth it was going to be very hard to find him. Soon he heard a shout from Ash. I found him. He is conscious, but he is pinned to the tree branch by his leg. It looks badly broken. I might need your help to get him untangled, Bracken, while I hold the bike in position. Bracken placed Noah in the recovery position that Crimson had taught him during first aid training several years before when the rebel group had lived on Earth. He then quickly climbed onto the back of Ash's bike. Once they were in position, he could clearly see that Dr. Greenwich was wedged firmly by a tree branch. Take the laser knife from the left pocket of my flight suit, Bracken, and cut the branch below my leg and then above it. That is the only way you will be able to free me. Once I'm on the ground, I'll get some pain relief, sort of, and I'll talk to you and Ash through how to strengthen my leg. All the color had drained from their leader's face, and he was bleeding profusely from the open leg wound. Bracken quickly did what was asked of him, though he felt terrible when Neon cried out in agony, while he held him awkwardly to the side of the skybike. Ash carefully maneuvered the machine back to the ground next to Noah. Neon looked over at their zoologist, who had come around, and was sitting up looking rather dazed at the trio as they landed. He seemed to be more worried about Noah than his own well-being. How are you feeling? Better than you by the looks of it, sir. Ash, can you get this flight pack over my back so I can find some pain meds in my medikit? Now he knew that Noah was going to be okay, Neon needed to tend to his own injuries. There was no knowing if the Brachiosaurus would return, or worse still, some other man-eating dinosaur or insect. Thankfully, the storm had departed as quickly as it had appeared, and Neon wasted no time placing the metallic needle kit next to his good thigh. He let out a sigh of relief as the pain quickly subsided. He then took a spray bottle and a silver extendable metal rod out of his pack. Once he applied the spray to the wound, the bleeding stopped immediately. He then handed Ash the metal rod. Ash, I'll get you to position your hands on either side of the brake and bracken. You put both hands around my ankle and start applying pressure by pulling my leg towards you. While he does this, Ash, you apply pressure both sides of the wound to strengthen the limb. When the whole leg is straight, lay that rod next to my leg and press the lever at the end. It will automatically send out arms, which will clamp around my leg to maintain traction and support. Once I get back to the ship, I have in the supply locker a calcium growth drug that will knit the femur bone quickly. I will start to be able to bear weight on it in a couple days. Once this task was done, Neon had Noah come close to him so he could run the laser scanner over his head and body. You have a slight concussion, but apart from that, you got off pretty lightly given how hard the bike hit the ground. Bracken. Can you and Ash ride back to the ship and have it come to pick us up? Noah and I will stay hidden from sight until you return. I've had quite enough adventure for one day, and I don't want to attract those dinosaurs we saw earlier to this location. If you wish, you can return to the forest to take samples tomorrow. But I'm going to be laid up for a while until this leg heals. The pair did what was requested of them by their leader, and soon the infinite lotus was hovering over their location as the two wounded men were taken up one by one to the ship. It was soon decided by Neon and the captain that they would postpone their mission of this area until a future date. Given the amount of bad luck they had thus far with their mission, Neon was thinking that they should just abandon it altogether and return to Rulandia. Nothing seemed to be going their way, but he soon changed his mind and chose to press on with their plans to map out the rest of the continents, even if it meant not landing at each place for further exploration. The ship passed over many different land formations on the continent, and those on board who took the time to scout the land below them 
were very surprised at what they saw. There was a large, barren desert with sand for hundreds of miles. Every now and then they would spot a skeleton of a dinosaur lying crispy white against the golden sands. Both Noah and Ash thought it very odd that the creatures would travel so far from the green pastures and into the desert. However, after reading that the beasts would often wander away from their herds to die, this seemed a logical enough explanation as to why the skeletons were where they lay. Finally, the ship was passing over ocean waters again and heading towards the last few continents of Judison. The crew did not attempt to stop at the next two locations. The land formations below were barren of any vegetation and it seemed pointless to land there. However, the last continent to be explored was quite the opposite terrain. There were snowy mountains and forests, lakes and valleys, which did not look far different from the landscape of Rulandia. Neon decided that it was worth investigating before the ship made its way home. The captain landed the infinite lotus in a lush green valley which was very similar to Reborn Valley. Before they had arrived at their location, Bracken had managed to fix the damaged skybike so that both machines would be operational should they decide to scout the area. My leg hasn't quite healed enough for me to feel comfortable getting on a bike today. So I want Ash and Noah to take one bike and Indigo. You can ride with Bracken. I don't want either parties to make contact with the ground until we can be sure there's nothing of danger lurking around. You all got that, team? The allotted group nodded in reply to their leader's request and made ready to depart the ship. The heat outside hit them with a blast of hot air as the ship's doors were opened. It didn't take long before the scouts were zooming through the valley, heading east towards a mountainous region and the most magnificent giant waterfall they had ever seen. It tumbled down from the crest of the mountain and fell into a deep, inviting pool. Bracken maneuvered the skybike down next to the pool to take a closer look. He spied a few small sangre millipedes sunning themselves on a rock. They looked very much like the species on Rulandia. Bracken took a small chunk of dinosaur meat from his bag and threw it next to the bugs. They all scurried away under the cover of the rocks and made no attempt to reappear to eat the tempting morsel. Instead, a young fox-like creature appeared with the rustling of bushes and snatching up the piece of meat in its mouth, it hurried back into the cover of the undergrowth. It looks safe enough to make contact with the ground. What do y'all reckon? I don't think we'll be in for any nasty surprises. That creature looked very much like a close relative to the wild dog that I've seen in the woodlands in Rulandia. They do not like being in our company, and will run away when confronted. Well, if the rest of you are up to it, shall we park the bikes in hover mode and take a closer look? This pool sure looks inviting. I'm cooking in this flight suit and a dip in the water is just what I need right now. I guess you'd better check if it's okay first, though, Ash. Once their botanist had given the all clear, they stripped down to their undersuits and were all soon swimming in the cool, clear water of the pool, with not a care in the world. I guess we need to tell the others about this place. They will seem mean to keep it all to ourselves. Noah made this comment as he emerged from behind the waterfall for the second time during their swim and Indigo sighed happily as she climbed onto a rock and set about combing through her long, wet hair. I think this region is even more beautiful than Rulandia. It seems as if it would be an ideal continent to start a new colony. Well, I think now that we've cooled down, it might pay to head along the mountain range for a bit, and then make for the ship. Firstly though, I'm going to take a scanned image of the spot with my data processor to show Dr. Greenwich. The four climbed back onto their sky bikes and headed off along the mountain range. As they left, they didn't notice several pairs of dark brown eyes following their movements with interest from the cover of some nearby bushes. The scouts wasted no time in showing the others the images that had been taken of the waterfall and surrounding area. As it was dusk by the time they had returned to the ship, 
it was decided by Neon that everyone on board, including Zacharias's children, would make a journey to the beautiful spot the following day. While the scouts had been gone, Neon, Zacharias, and the captain had surveyed the valley and deemed there was no threat whatsoever to any of them. Given the grassland would have had some form of grazing dinosaur frequented, had the species been prevalent on this continent, there was no sign of their dung. The only large beasts they did spy were a hairy sort of large elephant with long tusks. The data watch listed them as mammoths. When they saw the men, they headed off very quickly away in the opposite direction, which offered up the idea they were afraid of humans. There was also not a single sighting of any pteranodon, so it was soon established that this continent was of a different geological period to the other places they had visited thus far. The next morning, everyone prepared themselves for the day's outing. Even the captain somewhat reluctantly joined the group as they headed off in the direction of the waterfall. Neon thought that everyone deserved a well-earned break away from the ship, and although he had to take a sky bike because of his leg injury, all the explorers had an awesome day while basking in the hot summer's sun. It was late afternoon when they returned to the ship. All were tired, happy, and blissfully unaware their afternoon was going to have a surprising turn of events. Ash was the last person to enter the ship, and he had just turned around to push the button on the control panel to close the entrance door when something, or should it be said, someone, came rushing towards him from behind a cabinet nearby. With a shocked expression on Ash's face, he grasped the fur clothing of the young girl and held onto her with both arms around her waist as she frantically struggled and kicked to try and free herself from his tight hold. Who the... Ah! There was a very good reason for Ash's sudden outcry, because the young girl had just sunk her teeth deep into his lower arm. Neon stepped forward quickly, and taking the back of the girl's head firmly in his hands, he pulled her face away from Ash's bloodied wound. That will be quite enough of that, young lady. Everyone else just looked on in stunned silence, trying to take in what was happening. The young cave girl had coffee-colored skin, with long, wiry black hair that looked unkempt. Her crudely fashioned dress was made of mammoth fur, and she wore leather shoes, which were also plainly stitched together. Me go, me go. The cave girl cried out frantically, with a wild fear in her dark brown eyes. Neon asked Noah to fetch his medikit, so he could give the cave girl something to calm her down. She was starting to hyperventilate in her distress of being caught by the strange humans. Once the drug had done its job, her body quickly relaxed in Ash's arms, and the girl was gently lowered to the floor. Neon then took a spray from his bag to stop the bleeding of Ash's bite, and also to disinfect it. Who knew what deadly germs or diseases the strange child might be carrying which the colony had never been presented with before? With a motherly expression, Azure looked down into the half-closed eyes of the cave girl, and she thought that this child would not be far different in age than Amethyst. Oh, look at the poor wee girl. She must have been terrified to be trapped by you, Ash. It was not you she was taking a chunk out of. And what was she doing on our ship anyway? Beats me, but it's awesome. Now we are not the only humans on Judison. I had actually thought about the existence of cave people yesterday, when we spotted the mammoths, but I didn't really think that they would exist on this planet. Yet here we are, looking at one. What are you planning to do with her? Return her to her people and see if we can communicate with them. It would seem pointless to come all this way, discover what we have, and not explore this continent to its full potential. We might be able to offer the cave people some assistance, and they might offer us an insight into Earth's distant past. We could well learn from them, as much as they can learn from us. What say they are hostile, though? Given the way this young girl has behaved, they come across as mere savages. As the Zerf stated before, the girl was terrified of us trapping her. It all goes back to the fight-or-flight instinct of all mammals. We 
can't blame her for trying to protect herself when she became trapped. We would do exactly the same if the tables were turned on us. Neon took a Medi-Seal bandage from his kit and started applying it around Ash's wounded arm. So how are we going to return her to her people, sir? Well, probably the best option would be to place a microchip tracker on her and leave her to recover from the sedation on the ground outside the ship. That way, she will not think she is being followed when she returns to her family. What say there are hundreds of them, though? If we just turn up at their village or cave or however they live, we might be set upon. I very much doubt clubs and spears would be any match to laser guns. And if we set them to echo mode before we arrive at their camp, I'm sure we'll be quite safe. So with that said, who is willing to join me on this mission? Noah and Bracken immediately said they would go, and Ash, not wanting to seem cowardly, said he would join them as well. The more eyes to see any potential trouble brewing would be appreciated. Will you join us too, Zacharias? Yes, as long as there is a spare laser gun for me to carry. Okay, well, I'll administer that tracker into her deltoid muscle before she comes around anymore, and we will move her on to a grassy area a short distance away from the ship. Ten minutes later, the group watched on from behind the reflected glass window on the ship's bridge as the cave girl got to her feet. She seemed very wobbly at first, but soon enough she stumbled off as quickly as she could, heading in the direction of the mountains. The following day, the men readied themselves to visit the cave people. Neon and Zacharias were going via a skybike, while the other four men started out on foot towards the destination the tracker had located the village. It was only a mile from the ship. Each man was carrying a laser gun preset to echo mode. Neon had also placed a number of tempting food items in a backpack. He wanted the cave people to know they were coming in peace, so he thought the sweet treats would be a new and exciting gift for the prehistoric folk who would never have tried anything like chocolate or candy before. As they drew closer to the caveman's location, Neon could sense Zacharias's apprehension. He kept fidgeting with the straps on his flight suit and repositioning his body weight at the back of the bike, making it waver slightly every time he moved. I'm sure everything will be fine, Zacharias. The cave girl would have told her people about us, and given she was released unharmed, there is no cause for them to be hostile towards us. I'm sorry that my nerves seem to have got the better of me, but you've known me long enough now, Dr. Granite, to know I'm not a man who likes confrontation. Still, the men proceeded with caution when they could see smoke winding its way slowly upwards through the trees near a cliff. It did seem as if the young girl had informed her clan of the strangers, because as soon as the cave people saw the men approaching, they stopped what they were doing and watched on. However, no one appeared alarmed nor threatened, as they allowed the scout group to enter the campsite unharmed. There, next to the fire, was a group of men, one of whom wore a saber-toothed tiger skin, which no one else was wearing so Neon assumed he was the chief, or head tribesman, of the clan. Next to him stood a young girl who looked very much like the one they had found in the Infinite Lotus the previous day. Although Neon couldn't tell for certain until he was standing very close to the group and he could see the small indent that had been left on her arm when the tracker was placed. Neon soon realized that she must be the clan leader's daughter. My name is Dr. Greenwich. We have come in peace. Me rule why you come. When the chief said this, he pointed to himself, and then casting his hand upwards, he pointed to the sky. Neon wasn't sure how he could answer this question. He assumed the chief thought that they had come from another planet. Technically, that was correct, but given the Earthlings had been on Judison for eleven years, it was going to take some explaining with the language barrier to convey that information to the chief. Instead of trying to explain himself, Neon went to open his data watch so he could show the clan leader Planet Earth, Judison, and the colony on Rulandia. But as soon as he put his hand on the button to unlock the screen of his data watch, the chief stood up abruptly. You come roll. 
As Rule said this, he pointed to the entrance of a large cave. Neon's team lifted up their laser guns quickly, and in return, several of the cavemen took up their clubs. Neon waved his arms in a slow, downward motion to get his men to put away their weapons. I think Rule wants to show me something. Don't get alarmed, men. I don't want to spook these people before getting to know them a little better. The chief also let out a disapproving grunt to his own men, and they lowered their clubs and went back to what they were doing before the explorers had arrived. You come row now. Can they come? Neon pointed over to his men. One. The chief held up his thumb for Neon to see. Dr. Greenwich quickly pointed to Ash before the chief changed his mind. He had no idea what they were heading into, but he thought Ash was as good a man as any to take into the cave with him. The chief led the two men past a large pile of mammoth tusks which were all tied together to form a gate. It had been left resting against the rock wall at the entrance to the cave. It must have been put there and pulled across at night to offer them protection as they slept from the wild animals that roamed the area. The doctor and Ash were quite surprised as they were led through the cave. They were expecting it to get dark inside, but every so often along the walls of the cave a torch had been placed and they lit up the wonderful paintings that had been created by the clan depicting their life while hunting and gathering food. Very soon they came upon a large underground cavern. There were fur blankets lying around in various nooks and crannies, so there was no doubt this was the clan's sleeping quarters. It was here that Neon spied something odd, something totally out of place. Up on a rock shelf, which took pride of place over the large sleeping quarters, was a space probe. Rule led them straight to it, and he lifted it carefully down from its resting place. It had been turned off, however, he was eager to point out the World Controller's logo, which was the same logo that was engraved at the top of Neon's data watch. You good man, come help rule. Neon nodded in reply. Not that he could think why the cave people would think that the space probe had been a good omen as to the intentions of the Earthlings. Perhaps the probe had shown up when they had been experiencing hardship, but whatever the reason, the logo the colony had come to detest all those years ago had indeed helped them with the ongoing communication the colony would be able to share with the cave clan now. Ten minutes later, after the chief had spoken to his people, everyone did their best to communicate with each other as a form of trust towards an ongoing, happy relationship. Neon took the food from his bag, and there was much ooing and aahing from the clan, as they munched on the sweet treats while offering the scout group some freshly cooked meat. Before leaving, Neon promised Rule they would return in the near future and bring new tools for the cave clan to use, which would help make life a lot easier. This sent a ripple of excitement among the cave people when Rule relayed the information to them in their basic language. Several hours later, the rest of the team on the Infinite Lotus were greatly relieved to see the men return unharmed, with gifts of fur blankets tucked under their arms. There was much to talk about as they prepared to head for home. After such an eventful and sad beginning to their mission, Neon was grateful that the evolution of Judison was going to be in good hands. With the mistakes of Earth firmly cemented in the colony leader's mind, there was no way Judison was going to end the way that Earth had done, by the hand of man. The End